We'll call the meeting to order. Roll call. Uh, Councilman <coughs> Here. Davis. Here. Nelson. Here. Reese. Here. Hagerly. Here. Butterfield. Here. O'Brien. Here. Osmus. Here. All present. I stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we aren't all here. We got uh, Justin that is not here. Oh yes. Excuse me. Yes. Just, Councilman Ask is uh, excused. All right. Um, any proposed uh, additions or deletions? We just have the one agenda item. So we'll uh, we'll go to the regular business, the Wilmer Broadband Project update, and we'll call on Kyle. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to come before you this evening to give the Council an update on uh, the, really the last year and a half of work that staff and its partners have put, been putting in for a uh, broadband project for the City of Wilmer. So tonight is really a is meant to be an informative meeting for the council to ask questions of us and of our consultants, of our staff, uh, for better understanding and, and get more comfortable with uh, with the project and to ask those questions. Staff will be providing an update on, on the proposed broadband project. Tonight's conversation will cover four primary areas of discussion uh, as follows. So the preliminary survey results, the city conducted survey <coughs> to gather feedback on the need for broadband in the community. Second item, proposed a proposal for continued outreach and education. The City Council will hear a proposed plan for continued outreach and education to ensure that residents and businesses are aware of the broadband project and its benefits. Third area we'll be discussing tonight is, pup, is project financing. Municipal advisors will, be, will provide an overview of the project financing plan. And then finally, we'll, we'll end the conversation tonight on a uh, draft contract between the City of Wilmer and Hometown Fiber. Uh, we'll present that contract uh, for you to, to review tonight. Contributors and advisors uh, to this project have been very, very important to, to the success and where we're at for this project so far. Uh, first, I'd like to thank <coughs> members of our broadband committee uh, in attendance tonight. Dave Sisser is in attendance tonight. Um, and Larry is not here tonight, but Larry Fuyan has also been a very crucial and important member of our broadband committee. Uh, so those are our two members out of uh, from the public that have joined. Hometown Fiber, Kyle Moorhead, the founder and president of Hometown Fiber, and Marlena Pfeiffer, who's been our, who's been my go-to. Uh, we probably exchange a dozen emails a day. Um, on going through this project. So uh, very, very important, um, great people to work with. Uh, Doug Green, Baker Tilly, uh, the city's municipal advisor, will give the council an, an overview and update on really a snapshot on time where we're at overall uh, with uh, city finances. And then uh, Laura Lewis, uh, principal and owner of LRB Public Finance Advisors. The city brought Laura and her team on uh, last year to give us a um, they have, she has an insight, has done these types of projects before, has done this types of project financing before, and so we thought it was very important to bring somebody on with that expertise to work with uh, Baker Tilly and their team uh, to have a thorough project um, financing overview for you to consider. Overall, the city staff is making progress on this project and remains committed to ensuring a responsible and successful project for Wilmer. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Marlena Pfeiffer, and she will uh, start us off by going over the preliminary survey results that were collected over the last several weeks. <clears throat> okay, so. Welcome, Marlena. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so again, Marlena Pfeiffer, I've been, I've been the main consultant and point of contact, both with Justice Walker and Kyle Box on this project. Um, I have not, however, been able to spend much time with you, so I'm excited about that. I am excited to give you some of the preliminary survey results 
as they are coming in, update you on how that's going. It's going well. <laughs> so we, we could just skip to that part. But um, I know that Kyle Box has done a great job of keeping you up to date on the project status. And so a little bit of background here. When you, when you pass the network architecture engineering portion on October 2nd, it gave Hometown Fiber the green light to start the, the design phase of the project. Since then, we've been working closely with Bolton and Mink, uh, as well as your city staff, who, by the way, has put in countless hours and immeasurable, amount, immeasurable amounts of energy to make sure that this moves forward without a hiccup. Uh, and the end result serves the city of Wilmer, its residents and businesses in a favorable manner. So the city staff, your legal department, the broadband committee, and of course you, the council, all deserve a huge thank you for the hard work and attention to the detail that has been put into this thus far. Preliminary results. So on December 18th, a community survey was launched. Uh, 21 questions. It was designed to give us, the operators of the network, and you, the city leaders, insight into the amount of community support you can expect from the project. <clears throat> the survey also asks about frustrations of the community members regarding their current internet service options, as well as gives us some measurable data for consideration when designing the network and setting ISP expectations. <clears throat> These results will be used by your financial advisors, your legal department, and will be referred to as the project moves along. So I need to point out that these results are preliminary. Uh, as of right now, 90% of respondents have been residents, 3.5 business owners, and 6.5 has have listed themselves as both residents and business owners in the community. In the folders that you have at your desks, uh, there's a packet labeled Connect Wilmer Initiative preliminary, result, <laughs> preliminary Results Survey. And in the back of that, you will find the answers to all 21 survey questions with total respondent percentages listed. So again, these are preliminary. A healthy sample of the community is about 10 to 15 percent. Okay, that's, that's what we have to hit here. And in order to get there, we're gonna need some personal engagement with the community. Some avenues are gonna be created for community members to get further educated about the project. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on here, but right now I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights. Um, when deciding if a community is ready to support a municipal network, there's a few key things that you need to consider. So one, the first one, <coughs> is how much value do people in your community have? How much value do they put on having fast, reliable internet service, right? Do they see it as a crucial part of the community's long-term success? And do they feel it's necessary for their own success personally? So, when asked if they thought that the internet, if it was just as important as having other utilities, such as water and electricity, 72% uh, of respondents said that they strongly agree with the statement. Another 15 marked that they agree with the statement. Seventy-eight percent of respondents strongly agree that affordable, reliable, fast internet is important to Wilmer's future followed by another 15.4% agreeing that having internet surface that offers all three, so again, the reliability, affordability, and the speed, is important to the future of Wilmer. These two responses and the percentage of agreement show that your community puts, puts a high value on their internet connection and that they directly attribute it to the long-term <coughs> success of the city as a whole. All right, so that, that answers our first question, right? 
How do they feel it's going to impact them personally, though? When you read through these packets, right, flip back to the back pages and look through some of those answers, uh, there's a little section that covers this in more detail. So look at some of that. A couple of ones that I pulled out that I thought were important, though, <clears throat> were that 78% of the survey respondents say that having access to this will improve their quality of life. That's a big number. Another 47% of your community says that it is going to increase their ability to earn. So it's not 78%, but it's near half. Right, so that means that with this infrastructure that you're building, 47% of your community gets to increase their income. All right, so the next thing we have to look at when taking things into consideration is what service do they have now, right? And what service does the community have now and how happy are they? Currently, most of your community is being served by Spectrum. 84.5% of respondents claiming Spectrum as their provider. There are some here being served by Lumen, Windstream. Those are slivers compared to the 84, almost 85% of Spectrum customers. Uh, that needle right there that sits in the, the two to 500 range, that's the average download speed people are claiming. So the speed at which they can receive the information. Uh, so I just put that on there for fun, really, because the infrastructure that you're building is going to make that needle swing really far and hit that 500 to 2G mark. So it's, it's a fun one to watch dance a little. Um, so 85% Spectrum customers. How much are they paying? The majority of people are paying 80 to to $100 a month for their service closely followed by another portion paying 61 to 80 dollars a month. So these dollar amounts represent that the average download speed needle, the one that I showed sits represents where it's sitting as far as how much they're receiving. Anything people are paying above that 80 to 100 dollar mark is for larger packages to meet their needs and anything below, so actually about 19% of your population I would say anything below that 60 to 80 mark, those people are having a really hard time getting all of their needs met by their, by their provider. So question two is answered, right? Now we know that your community puts high value on their internet speed and reliability. We know that it's going to increase the quality of life in Wilmer. We know that the network has to provide, has to fall within certain ranges to be considered a significant improvement. But even with that, the last thing that we have to look at is if people are willing to make a switch. Right? Sometimes people don't like change. Sometimes they're locked into a contract or they just don't want the hassle. So Wilmer's ready. 43% of respondents are willing to switch right now with no other caveats attached. 52% said they'll switch if the network offers more reliability, and it will because there's nothing more reliable than fiber. And 78% of respondents are going to switch to the city network if it's more affordable than their current service. So, check, check, check. All of those work out. These survey results hold a lot of weight. And I have studied other successful networks and their results. I was expecting a positive percentage from, from Wilmer. I, I wasn't expecting this large of one. Uh, the survey as of now remains open. And there's going to be some community engagement coming up to draw more attention to the project, drive some more survey results, and educate them, educate your residents and businesses about the ins and outs of the Connect Wilmer initiative. Thus far, all systems are a go. 
So any questions on that right now? Audrey. Thank you, Mayor Reese. Um, at the beginning, you said for the survey to be successful that it needed to be 10 to 15 percent. Did you say what percentage we're at right now? You said the survey's still open, but where are we at on, so, on that scale? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's still open. Uh, we've gotten about two-thirds of what we need, right? So that's 10 to 15 percent of addresses, not population. And, and it climbs daily. Now, the cool thing about this is that since it launched, these percentage rates have remained about the same. They dance in, in tenth increments, right? So, so the trend remains the same, and we expect it to. And how long will the survey stay open? Until we get all of the answers that we need. Okay. <laughs> Marina, can you give me a feel for what I'm getting or the average household is getting for service right now in Wilmer? And what's the difference between that and a gig? Because I see... Um, willing to pay $70 for one gig, $60 for one gig. Um, I'm, I, I, I don't have a feel for what one gig is. Is that two or three times more than what I'm getting? You know, I have, I have something I can send you, actually, that that sort of gives you a checklist of if you wanted to download this book, right? And at this download speed, it would take you this long, right? And then it goes all the way through to if you wanted to download, you know, every single legal book that ever existed, it would take you, you know, 365 days at this speed and, you know, six hours at this speed. So that's not something that I have on me right now, but I can certainly send it to Kyle Box so that you have a, a, a better read on what that speed means, and how much of an increase that is. It's a lot. How does it compare to the average? Can you, can you, give, can you relate that in any way? Well, Kyle Moorhead, can you do that? Well, there's, uh, when you look at a fiber uh, infrastructure like this, you're looking at speed and the ability for that to keep up with change. So, you know, uh, technology that we had 10 years ago was fine for that era, but it would be woefully underserviced today. So when we put this infrastructure together, one of the aspects that we're looking for is speed and the ability for that to be easily and affordably upgraded as needed. So when you put the fiber infrastructure and you just replace the modems on each end or the equipment on each side and you keep going. Right now, to answer your question, Mayor, it's about five times more for one gig and 10 times more for two gig. And there are services that are expected to be much higher on speed. I think the average household, you know, do they need a gig? Are they going to take advantage of a gig? You know, maybe. Some will, some won't. Um, but the reliability that the infrastructure and the architecture brings is another key aspect to it. And the, uh, so it's, it's a little bit of, is it affordable? Is it reliable and is it fast? Well, we know fiber is going to be really fast. Um, we know that it will be affordable because the maintenance costs are lower, and we know that it's reliable. And so it checks all those boxes as well. I would guess that a high percentage of the residents of Wilmer that are my age group are pulling up the West Central Tribune to look at the paper and maybe some Facebook and that's it. Right. Right. So what they, what you have now works for that. Right. Yeah. Now I spent some time with a local business today and he can't run all of his computer systems and his security cameras and his doorbell and his laptops and everything at the same time. There's just, there's just not enough juice. Right? And you know who gets really excited about this, though, are the younger people. Right? They want to do gaming and online and uploading and live streams and things like that. And this will allow them to do that. 
whether or not we think they should. <laughs> and I, I, if I may, the, the trend continues to add more and more devices, you know, like uh, keep adding more Internet of Things to your home, different like ring doorbells and camera here, camera there, some appliance here, some appliance there that people keep bringing into their home. And uh, it, when the Internet goes out, all of those things stop working at the same time, so it becomes more and more painful. And the trend for that is to continue. So it's not just, you know, tablets and devices. It becomes smart homes and integrated systems for all kinds of business, uh, commercial and residential applications. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the reliability, I, I really lean heavy on the reliability side because you need, a, 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 you know, a line or a connect, connection to your facilities that are fast and reliable because when it is disrupted or it doesn't have the capacity, you start feeling that pain. And it starts to <coughs> I just found out that if you go to buy a TV today, you can't buy a regular TV. It's a smart TV. It's a Roku TV. And that's all you can get. And that, that's yeah. another example of the changing landscape of what's happening, you know, with video content. More and more people are getting streaming services. And it's frustrating if it's not working quite right. And the more of those devices you add into a home and the more people you have simultaneously watching, you know, it's the speed needs to be there. But again, it's a reliability factor. You want that reliability. Yeah. yeah. And that's where the infrastructure part comes into play. Mm -hmm. Andre. Thank you, Mayor Reese. I took the survey, but I'm not remembering. Are there any specific questions as it relates to people working from home? that may not classify, quote, as a business, but have to have good internet connections for their work that they're doing from home? Well, I don't have it memorized, so give me a moment. Which one was it? Number, number Page five, uh, question four. We asked that question in a couple different ways. We asked it re regarding work. We asked it regarding health care and other subject or other uh, questions along the way that, you know, quality of life questions, things like that, that all kind of relate back to that working from home is one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as of then, it looks like 79.35% says that this access will allow them to work from home. <clears throat> Any questions for Marina? Carl? So I, you talk about how reliable uh, fiber optic is. Why, why is it so much more reliable? What, I mean, can fiber optic be cut like a? Oh, sure. So why, what makes that safer? Well, I think the main reason is the technology is optical and it's kind of immune to uh, water and other types of interruptions where the, the copper-based systems like coaxial and twisted pair are very subject to moisture, uh, temperature changes, and all that, and optical cabling doesn't have really any of that. Um, the other thing that happens with the reliability is a lot of the infrastructure that exists today in Wilmer is aerial, and um, that's also prone from time to time to uh, critters like squirrels and stuff chewing on things and wind and ice and all that. And the infrastructure we're proposing is, you know, as much as underground as we can possibly make. Because we know that if you keep everything underground and spliced uh, under grade, that you don't have the problem with the snow plows running over pedestals uh, and uh, cars bumping into stuff. 
uh, the wind, the ice, all that the, on the lines, and then of course the squirrels. You know, you don't have to worry about the squirrels. <laughs> I don't mean to talk about squirrels too much, but they do cause some problems. They chew things. <laughs> Even with fiber networks that are aerial, they have problems with that type of uh, critter disruption. <laughs> And they cause problems in weird ways too. I won't. I shouldn't get into it. But it, there's a lot of problems that we're trying to architect out, so that the the operation of the network is reliable as we can make it, and as long it has longevity with uh, the conduit network and different things. So, as as technology changes and as needs change for the community, <clears throat> it's not cost prohibitive to update. Thank you. Did I yeah. Hope I answered. Thank you. Yeah. Audrey. Thank you, Marys. Um, the comment or the participants responded that $51 is a fair price to pay for internet. What do you think about that? Is this anywhere that close great. to sound <laughs> something that can be done? Yes. Yeah, so the, the pricing on this, right, just as you have packages that you choose from today, right, you get this much speed for this much money, right, it's, it's the same thing. So th that's the average of what they thought was fair, and it's absolutely attainable. Okay. If I may, um, the market research shows that it's about seventy-five dollars actually. Okay. Where you start, the, the subscription rate drops way off. So we know that if you have packages from seventy-five on down to about thirty for the lower end uh, subscribers. Uh, you catch pretty much anybody that's going to be purchasing. Now, there's always going to be people that want it for less and always going to be people that want to have more things and more stuff. So, But we have noticed that it's about $75 where it drops off. It doesn't surprise me that the survey respondents put less money on there. You know, Not that they're not being truthful, but they're looking at what is justifiable to them or what would they pay, and they're going to pick the lowest level that they think they would pay for it. So that's an important number for us to, to, to watch. I'm more concerned about, do I say capacity for industrial growth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's not going to be a problem with the fiber infrastructure. Yeah, that's, the, the growth is one of the key things for doing it this way that we're proposing because it's uh, it's easy to keep up with the market demands and changes as things go. Well, I can't begin to understand the fiber. I'm, I'm the copper mm -hmm. age, and uh, it's hard to understand the capacity that comes with. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of capacity. fiber optic. Yeah, it, it it is really surprising how much they can get down that one little strand that's a little bit larger than a hand, straight, hand, <coughs> strand of hair, you know. But uh, it works. <laughs> it's extremely reliable and very fast. Yeah. Mayor? Yes. I hope and pray this never happens again, but unfortunately it might, probably will, which is the COVID situation. <laughs> We had a lot of people at home. We had a lot of students. We had a lot of teachers. We had a lot of everybody at home. Uh, that's why when I look at this type of system, that's what this thing really rings true. Because back in those days, it seemed like everybody was having issues because they were just being overloaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. You know, that's one of the things that the pandemic really pointed out. Even though we started Hometown Fiber before the pandemic to solve this problem, that really just launched it into a whole different level of community awareness that when you, it's kind of like if everybody picked up the telephones in the old days, <laughs> all at the same time, mm -hmm. not, you know, nothing would work. But it's the same thing with the internet. Everybody started loading up a network architecture that wasn't designed for that, wasn't able to handle that. And so they've been kind of playing catch up ever since then, the whole, the whole industry has. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually, that was when I got involved in this. I mean, I've, I've always lived in an area where I had a couple options, 
for internet service providers. So I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and it never occurred to me that my friends 10 miles down the road couldn't get enough connection for their children to do online schooling. Hmm. Just never even occurred to me that that could be a problem or that when they watch Netflix, they get the purple spinny wheel, right? Because it's loading. Right, so that's that's when I started thinking that something something has to be done, mm. right? I remember as a child, you'd pick up the phone and the gal on the other end would say, "Number, please." <laughs> <laughs> and our home was eight nine, and my dad's <laughs> store was two six, and they would plug it in. I don't remember that far back, but I did just explain to my 15-year-old that I could hit zero and call an operator and ask for a phone number. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure she knows what a phone book is either. But. It's interesting. It's, I can remember some of those easy numbers, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember back then, too. Okay. so. As the survey progresses and as we get more results in, right, we're 10 percent is, is the minimum, right? I don't like stopping there. So, so I'm, I'm going to push a little bit above that, right, make sure that we have a really good sample and know exactly what's, we, we can do some solid math off of it. In order to do that, we're going to need some level of community engagement, right? And some avenues created for the community to learn about the project and be a little further educated. If you are going through those folders, there's some comments that were left on the surveys, right? And some of them, the first page, first page and a half, are just 100% full steam ahead. People are excited. <clears throat> And then I pulled some that will also show you that people have questions, right? They don't quite understand how this works. They got a postcard in the mail saying that there's a survey that they should take, right? So we need to create a way to get out there in front of them and, and tell them about it. So we will jump into that. <clears throat> okay, so we have fondly started referring to this as the Connect Wilmer Initiative. Uh, preliminary survey results are great. Your city staff are absolutely rock stars, and you have lined up some pretty well known names in the legal and financial world to protect you and ensure that this is, is a success. So now all we have to do <laughs> is make sure that your community stakeholders, your anchor institutions, your businesses and constituents are fully aware and educated on the project. So if they don't know what's going on and they don't have a clear understanding of why the city is building the infrastructure, or what the benefits are for them, both immediately and in the long term. If, if they don't know what will and will not be asked of them, right, if, then, I mean, if they don't even know that this is coming, then we can't count on their support and we need their support when it comes time to sign up for services. So the plan for this is the Community Outreach and Educational Program. It's broken into a multi-step approach, just like the building of the project is, right? The first portion of this begins immediately. In fact, some of it has already begun out of necessity. As this initiative continues forward and the infrastructure is built, there's going to need to be a constant effort to keep the project in front of people and have them updated on timelines and options. So 
um, if I if I understand correctly, the city is rebranding, correct? Correct. Yep. All right. So you all understand then the branding and imagery and the role that that plays when presenting to the public. This project will have its own brand and its own name. So just like anything else that requires a customer base for success, this will require a campaign. We're going to focus on, again, the connection and education. So what we're trying to do here is just get a high level of involvement and excitement in the community. There, there has to be a buzz, right? People have to be talking about this. And you want to make sure that the community has the information they need to make a decision when the time comes. The Community Outreach and Educational Program, it's, it, it's a boots on the ground, handshaking, question answering, connection building effort, right? And we're going to try to do three main things with that. So one, introduce the benefits and raise awareness of the city's plan to bring fiber optic internet to the community. Two, cultivate business and resident support for the initiative by highlighting its reliability, affordable speed, sustainability, <coughs> both financial and otherwise. And then three, develop the city of Wilmer's public image as a technologically advanced and innovative place to work and live. To do this requires a level of transparency, right? By offering transparency and creating trust within the community and fostering those personal relationships, we're going to, one, elevate the number of survey respondents. Okay, so again, we have to get to that 10 to 15 percent response rate here. Uh, thus far, we have sent flyers, used social media. The city staff, again, was great in promoting it. But if people don't know the five W's, right, the who, what, when, where, why, then they might not have understood the ask or the benefit of them taking the survey. So it's important to get that out. We're going to be able to answer their questions. So what you're doing is gifting your community the fastest, most reliable internet in the nation. It's some of you go, oh, I don't believe that, but it's, it's competitive. That alone will raise questions. So we need to create avenues to offer information and interaction. And then you, the, the representatives, you need to know that you have the backing <coughs> and support of your community so that you can move forward in full confidence. And this will accomplish that as well. I mean, I don't know when the right time to ask this question is. But I'm oh, going to no. ask it now. Yeah. I, I can't understand the head of transporting this information through fiber optic. Where does it all begin? How does it, how does it do that? I, do you understand what I'm asking? I think I do, Mayor. If I may, there's uh, fiber optic lines and different technologies that are interconnected throughout the world. Yeah. And uh, there's a group of people and companies that have elevated up to a different tier level, which is called like a tier one. Yeah. And they're considered like the backbone of the internet, so to speak. Yeah. There's a lot of terms that get thrown around. But it comes down to economics. With the, with the tier one providers, they don't have to pay for <coughs> access and they have, have a lot of financial freedoms. Um, one of the first things we look at when we talk to a community is, how is, how is the internet going to get there? We have to tackle a medium mile project or do we have to plow fiber to Minneapolis or Sioux Falls or Duluth or, you know, how far does it have to go? You guys are geographically pretty lucky with your connectivity. 
because you do have fiber optic lines that come from all directions in and out of your community. And two of them are tier one networks. So you have access to a significant amount of bandwidth in your, in your town. It's just not getting out on a fiber platform to the, to the subscribers. So, so maybe, so stop me if when I missed up, <laughs> but, but I understand this on a much simpler level. He'll start talking and very, he'll tell you how to build a watch every time when you ask what time it is. So, so uh, three tiers of internet providers, right? The first are the big ones, right? This brings the internet across the ocean, right? And there are only a few of those. And then there's tier two, right? So there's, say there's three to, three to five really big guys, right? And they're making the internet go all over the world. And then there's tier two. So think national, right? National ISPs. And they have to buy the internet from tier one, right? And they, that's usually middle mile, yeah. right? So they don't necessarily own infrastructure. They, they usually do. They do have the infrastructure. They're okay. usually fairly large, uh, you know, companies that are national in scope. Um, they can really be any ISP that is dependent on a tier one for their service, which mm -hmm. most ISPs would be. And then there's tier three. And that's, those are the ISPs that bring it to the home, well, right? No, that, that's the, not They true. can go directly to it. Yeah, they, the tier three We've people are dependent on tier times. two people for their internet service, right? Right, so. So the idea is to get your community into the tier one networks as efficiently and cost effectively as possible, right? And they have those? And Wil Wilmer has uh, several lines that will bring that to you, which is attractive to other providers that want to come here and serve your community mm -hmm. because they, they can connect right in. So do you buy access to that tier three? You buy access to the tier one. To the tier one? Yep. And whoever provides internet service on your infrastructure will work with that tier one provider to get whatever bandwidth they need for their, to serve this area. But the idea is to have multiple tier twos, tier threes providers on your network, on your infrastructure that can ride on that. It's kind of like building a road and let anybody driving on it. It's, it's along those lines. Sorry for asking these basic questions, but no, I you want to understand I mean, it blows me away that you can run information both ways and it's, it stays together. <laughs> I, I, when, I, when I first started this, just, just so you know, and I was introduced to Kyle and we were talking about the possibilities here, my first question was, I was like, okay, this sounds great. What's fiber? Right? <laughs> Start there <laughs> and then tell me about it. So, so you're not alone. Right? You're not alone in your community either. Right? So back to, back to the outreach portion of this, people need to know this kind of stuff so that they understand it. Did that, did that satisfy you for now? Yeah. <laughs> you have a question on it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just coming from that, mm -hmm. so if we decide to do this, we won't have, it won't be proprietary to us if someone else in the community decided to make that connection with our community already, right? Yeah, the idea is that um, you build the, the, the pathway from uh, central locations out to the community, and then anybody that wants to provide service on that line and those lines can use them to get to your citizens. And I was going back to other providers we already have. Why wouldn't they do what we're talking about doing? Or could they do it? They, they could. They I, could. Okay. I mean, you could, I don't know, Kyle, maybe you can answer that with the RFP process. But, you know, there was a, a, an initiative by the city when we first started to put out a proposal to see if anybody would do that. I'm sorry, Kyle. That's, okay. That's all right. So I, and we, we highlighted this at our work session in December. And 
Uh, we talked or we talked briefly on it, and and really how this how how did this all start? And so this started over a year ago, year mm -hmm. and a half ago, about when the city put out a request for proposals to bring fiber to bring service to our industrial park. Um, it was real. Uh, that was the uh, area of focus, but really left it open ended in how we wanted to see what what could be offered to the city. And is it just limited to the industrial park, or is it? as we're here today, is it uh, maybe available to the entire city? And uh, the city did receive three proposals, one limited to just the industrial park. Uh, one was from a ISP to um, partner with the city to build out the entire city, but it would be on one network. And then the third proposal or, uh, was from hometown, uh, building a true open access network, an infrastructure for the city to build um, and to let other ISPs, other private businesses to be a part of and offer services to their customers. So um, it, yes, other companies could come in and, and do this. Um, it, it would be fantastic if they did, to be honest with you. Um, it, I mean, that's truly what, at the end of the day, we've had this conversation multiple mm -hmm. times. If, if somebody wanted to come in and, and build out the entire city, uh, like we're proposing with fiber to the home, great. I mean, that's what we're looking for from day one is the affordability, the speed, um, and the reliability of having fiber internet in our community. I mean, that, those are really the core um, values that we're building this project off of. So I know that was a long answer to your question, but um, yes, other people could, other companies could come in and do this, and um, we've addressed some of that through our RFP <coughs> process over a year ago. The amount of growth that we're seeing in our industrial park is going to demand higher speeds. Mm -hmm. I assume this is going to be adequate to uh, allow them to do business to the extent that, to the, the highest level. Yes, like Kyle had mentioned before, um, capacity is not going to be an issue. and, and like I just um, had mentioned as well, that was the area of focus when we started this, yeah. was to make sure our industrial park had the utility, the internet, the fiber, to operate their business successfully and um, to be shovel ready, uh, the term that we use to be shovel ready certified when it comes to development and other programs that come, this is just another aspect of that. And So you've got new companies maybe going up in the industrial park that had to pay a $50,000 connection fee just to get internet to their, internet to their building. We're, we're taking that away from any future development. I mean, we want to be able to provide businesses in our town that affordable connection so there's, those large dollar, those large ticket items aren't a factor when it comes to developing in our community. I haven't talked to Aaron about this, yeah. but I would guess that he's pretty excited about it, being able to have that large capacity available in our industrial. I think it's like I said. I think it's a great benefit for our in, for our industrial park. Um, there's a lot of exciting things that happen out in that area. I mean, again, this is just one sector of um, of the project that we're focusing on uh, on the industrial park. But um, possibilities are really endless when in, in future proof, in my opinion. <clears throat> Thanks, Kyle. Tom, Kyle, <clears throat> right back. I, <clears throat> you may have gotten. The email from Dave Baker on question 21. Did uh, yes, I did see that. Can you kind of address that on how, you know, he's concerned about taxes and Wilmer aren't going to go up? So other other people in Wilmer will kind of know what's going on with that? Um, I don't have the question in front of me. If, I got if it right you, here if, if you, you want. If you give me a second, I can pull it up and I might um, give me one moment, please. <clears throat> so the question was, just so everyone understands, the question was on the survey. Um, I feel the question number 21 was, I feel the city of Wilmer, Wilmer's plan for building a fast, affordable and reliable fiber optic service for everyone without raising taxes is, and then it was the very important, important, mm -hmm. however that raised. 
So the, the question um, that you're asking, Councilmember Butterfield, is uh, quoting from the email now, um, how to suggest no increases in taxes when you don't even know the cost yet? That was a question. Uh, what if there are cost overruns? What if the subscriptions don't come in like we're budgeting or anticipating for? Um, and how does so how does that all play into the financing to the bonding? And how do we come up with that short if there is a shortcoming? And um, I will answer your question. Um, I think you'll. I think we'll be able to answer your question better when we have our financial overview. When Laura Lewis and um, Doug Green talk about the financing and what the what risks come with this project, when it, especially when it comes to subscriptions or to uh, so, um, the end users to um, take rates to what we can expect or what we're aiming for. Um, I kind of I, I mm -hmm. don't have an answer directly for your question now, but I think we'll be able to answer that. If not, we'll circle back to it in a little bit, if that's okay, council member. Yeah. Thank you. I just know it's a big concern. He gave me a phone call today over it, so Let's then he let me know he's going to email everybody on the council app talking with me on it. So. I think it's a really good example of the type of questions that your community is going to have, right? I mean, it's what they're hearing is that they're going to get, you know, the, one of the nicest systems that there are out there, right? And, and so the question goes to how much does it cost and how are we going to pay for it, right? And how much is it going to cost me personally, right? So again, back to the outreach, you said Dave Baker? Yes. I'll put him on my meeting list, <laughs> right, for the, for the outreach program. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into some more well, of this. Just so you know, a little bit about Dave. He is very uh, forward on internet. Okay, good. He's actually good. our state representative. In Fabulous. The house. Okay. So he's all proactive yeah, he wants for this. this. But yeah, he's just worried about the average taxpayer and their taxes going up. You know, if a shortfall does come through. Because he already knows Wilmer's a, a high tax rate city right now. And this keeps going up, and he's been bringing this up, and he's worried about mm -hmm. everybody. And that was pretty much phone call with them today. Yeah, yeah. People are going to be worried about that. This, this last year and a half, right? I mean, this isn't, this isn't like we got together and we're like, hey, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool, right, if we just did this? I mean, there is, like I said, you, you have a really good team of financial advisors. You have people who will watch the health of the network. You have expected take rates. You have a survey that is still open, right? But that we, we use for math like this. All of this has been considered. And so none of this has been, we're not crossing our fingers on any of it, right? And if there is a red flashing light anywhere that goes, whoa, 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 maybe, maybe not, right? There's always a ripcord to pull. So, but again, they're questions that people are going to have, right? It's, it's not the status quo, right? So a little pushback, a little opposition is okay, right? It doesn't mean that it doesn't hold value. It means that people don't have a, have a really full, deep understanding of it yet. And I think that when you look at the operations agreement, right, that between Hometown Fiber and the city, a lot of those questions get answered there as well. The city of Wilmer is very fortunate. Some of the young staff that we have working who are yeah. so um, up-to-date and brilliant young they people, get it. Of, uh, members of our staff. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is Christopher, and I, 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 I'm just wondering, do you have anything to add to this, Christopher? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity. I wasn't expecting to no, speak. I, but, no, you didn't. But, uh, um, members of the council, I think that Fiber has and Connect Wilmer has the opportunity to be um, to provide a high speed access to Wi-Fi um, throughout the city. Um, I'm interested in learning more about 
the way that it works and um, our finance representative here tonight to speak about some of the impacts uh, financially that it will have on the city as well. Um, and you all know from when I first started, this project is one of the reasons I came here because I think it is a huge possibility to, or a huge reward to, um, to offer a high speed internet service to um, our residents. So I'm just in the back listening. Um, but right now I don't have any other comments, but. I appreciate your input, Christopher. You, you got it, thank you. How about Tom? Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I'd, I'd echo what Christopher, uh, Director Christopher had mentioned. Um, and I, I think uh, Mr. Green here from Baker Tilly and uh, the representatives from Hometown Fiber, they'll be able to explain a little bit more on how the the project might pay for itself as well. So um, I'm interested to hear more from them. Doug, did you have something you wanted to? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council again, Doug Green, Baker Tilly. Now, I, I think the next steps are obviously just to dig into the financials um, of the cash flows, the performers, the assumptions that are made. And um, uh, our colleague in the, in the process, Laura Luce, who have, who's gonna speak next, um, she'll have more uh, to say about it. But next steps is really um, getting into the uh, projections. It's, it all comes down to revenue projections and um, looking at the uh, viability of the project. And that's what we'll do uh, very closely. Thank you. From, from my understanding of... <laughs> which might be little, um, we're on the cutting edge we're in having this type of service in Wilmer, Minnesota. Nobody else has it. In Minnesota. Right. Open access. So there are about 600-ish uh, municipal-owned networks that are successfully running in the United States right now. And they are building. They're what? In, in our little world that we operate in. So in our little world <laughs> that we operate in, <laughs> um, municipal networks are growing at an astounding rate. I mean, it's, it's like fire spreading. So to have Wilmer, Minnesota join that and then to be the first successful one in Minnesota is huge, huge. All right. <laughs> I don't know is where it, to go from there. Huh? <clears throat> Sorry. Where do we go from here? Well. Out of state, Mayor. Yeah. Yes. When we, when we started this, our committee, when it was just, Justice Walker was the leader at that particular time, we asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I mean a lot of questions. And a lot of questions was about finance. And a lot of questions was about risk. Mm -hmm. And what he told us made us say, okay, we got to do this. We got to at least go look at it. Yeah. But man, I'll tell you what, it'll let the council know this committee <laughs> didn't let justice off very easily. And we didn't let Kyle either since he's took over. We've been asking a lot of questions. And committee, Dave and Juan and all these guys. And uh, so, they burn their keep. <laughs> <laughs> I sat in Kyle's office this, af this afternoon. Yeah, this <clears throat> afternoon. And got a tutoring of uh, of everything? Yeah. So you said that you've asked them a lot of questions. Have you have you had your questions answered satisfactorily so this far? Yes, we have. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. I so hmm? I interrupted. Please go. <laughs> it's your go show. On. You can <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you. All right. So in your packets, uh, turn to page five, please. And that's in the outreach and education. 
what we did here for the city's request was develop three different tiers of outreach. Okay, so I want you to look through this now. The deliverables on this, right? Like I said, we have to create avenues for people to do this, so we're, we're doing website content, educational content, brochures, postcards, flyers, email marketing campaigns, social media, paid advertisements. Um, conducting in-person and virtual information sessions. Those will be big, right? So if that is an evening at the library, right, where people can join us or something like that. Uh, provide educational information for media and meetings directly to Wilmer's anchor institutions. Also, also big. When you look through the tiers offered here, the main difference that you're going to see is, is the way in which this information is provided. Right, so, so tier one is up here. And when, we, when you're looking through these, I want you to also know that the targeted, when it says targeted <coughs> brochures, so if there are three targeted brochures, that means that I am targeting anchor institutions and large businesses, businesses and residents. Right? What questions did they have? What are their benefits? What are their asks? What is their timeline? <clears throat> After the educational campaign is delivered upon, there will be additional citywide and phase marketing that's required and will follow the, follow the phase development of this project. Right, so if we are building in phase one, right, and we, you have a map there in the back of your folder somewhere, um, then those people need to know things, right? When is this happening? What is their opt-in, opt-out? Opt <clears throat> when is the construction starting? Uh, ISP information, connection dates, things like that will have to stay in front of them. So we're lurking, working closely with your city staff to determine that scope of work and pricing and we'll keep you updated as the time for that gets closer. But right now, the ask is that you look through the deliverables, <coughs> look through the tiers and decide how much impact you want this campaign to have on your community, right? If, if I'm calling people, that's much different than if I'm walking in and shaking their hand and sitting down in front of them. Okay, so that's, that's when I say impact, that's what I mean. So that's, that's your, nest, your next at, ask from us. I've been talking too long. Are there any main questions here as you read over this? Council? I don't, I don't know what they're, they're thinking, but I'm thinking top notch. You all in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kyle? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, if I may, uh, this will be something that we continue to work with hometown fiber on it and city staff work together and um, I think give you a, a recommendation on what we should pursue, uh, what a staff recommendation to the council would be at an upcoming meeting. Um, this is, <clears throat> I think tonight you have seen how important the community and education and the outreach program will be to the success of this project, uh, just the added, added success. So um, when we, once staff have um, time to sit down and go through maybe in a little bit more detail with hometown, um, we will provide the council uh, with a recommendation on which avenue to consider. Um, but um, I think you're looking tonight, I mean, the more we can do, the more um, when you look at the options, tier one, tier, tier two, tier three, the more that we can do, uh, we feel the more successful we can be. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll leave it at that, but you can expect a recommendation from staff um, at an upcoming meeting. Yeah, I think, I mean, think about, you've, you've been being updated on this from the beginning, 
right? And there, there's still so many questions, right? So I'm not making the recommendation, but but someone who has who doesn't even know that this is happening yet, right? We have to get the word out there to make we get one shot at this. I didn't make sure even that know this how is to ask questions. Huh? I didn't even know how to ask the questions. <laughs> You didn't even know what questions you had until we started this. Right. <laughs> okay. If there's nothing else for right now, then I think we are turning it over to Doug and uh, Laura. Back to Kyle. Laura? <clears throat> Do you have a question? I can. Is there anyone? Is that correct? I can. So, right, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, at this time, I would like to introduce Laura Lewis. Uh, Laura is, uh, well, like I had mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, Laura was brought on as a municipal advisor, co-municipal advisor to this project to provide her expertise in uh, funding and bonding and financing um, open access uh, fiber projects um, that she's done uh, previously. And then Doug Green, as I mentioned, is also here with us tonight. Doug will provide the council with just an, uh, an overview of um, maybe a more snapshot or a closer defined look at Wilmer um, and where we sit as a city as well. So, uh, Laura, I will turn it over to you if you want to share your screen. I'm sorry to be an idiot. I can't figure out how to share my screen. Right. Oh, here. Oh. If not, I have uh, our backup plan ready. Uh-oh. There we go. Can you, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, Mayor, City Council, thank you for uh, letting me present. Uh, again, I'm uh, for those of you that have heard me before. I'm a huge uh, fiber advocate. I um, have worked with uh, cities in Utah for probably going on 15 years. So, in terms of cutting edge, uh, they were pioneers before their time, and um, you know, quite frankly, took some. Uh, you know, had some hard knocks because of that. Uh, a lot of lessons learned along the way. <clears throat> and um, now I'm, you know, pleased to report that uh, all of uh, their system is doing phenomenally well. And, um, you know, others out here in the West have seen that. And we've seen expansion, some joining, um, doing sort of partnerships with Utopia and UIA. Uh, and the 11 cities that they represent, some are doing it on their own with a, you know, contract with Utopia to build and manage. Some have branched out entirely on their own. And uh, it's, it's a phenomenal thing to see, to see the benefits from an economic development standpoint. So I um, uh, haven't been asked to address a few things I'm going to address, but I'll be very quick. So in regard to you know, some of the things I've learned over time relative to fiber, uh, one of the beautiful things that uh, I've learned about fiber is in order to increase speed, you don't need to change the fiber. The fiber has, um, to the best of anyone's guess at the moment, a 50 to 100 year life. It could be longer than that. If it gets cut, yes, it does need to be spliced, but that doesn't um, degrade the, the speed or integrity of the, the fiber. Um, but in order to increase capacity, they need to change the electronics out on the end. So it's not a matter of, you know, needing to run around and, you know, put in more cable or more. It, it really is changing the capacity. And I've been the, the beneficiary of that because when I first signed up for, I live in Murray City, Utah, and when I first signed up for um, the fiber project that they participated on with, um, with Utopia, Utopia stands for Utah Telecommunication Open Infrastructure Agency. When uh, they first signed on, uh, I think that, you know, the fastest I could get, I want to say was like uh, roughly a half a gig up and down. Um, and uh, now I can get a gig. I have faster service at my home than I do in my office in downtown Salt Lake City. And uh, and they didn't have to come to my house. They didn't have to dig up the road. <laughs> they didn't have to do anything. It's like, oh, gig, gig is now a thing. And they changed electronics out on their end. No disruption to me. And uh, suddenly I can you know, pay a little bit more and get a gig service. Uh, maybe of interest to you that that is the, uh, in terms of percentage increase of people signing up, more people are now requesting a gig than um, ever before on, on their um, services. 
And uh, I think people would be amazed. Again, I've just learned a lot in listening to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting about fiber and its use. Um, I was sitting in a meeting probably a year ago, and uh, <clears throat> someone stated, you know, the fact that the average American household has 22 um, uh, devices that, you know, can access the Internet in their homes. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't have 22, right? I mean, I really, I really did. And um, I'm a single mom of two kids. And uh, so I went up and approached this guy for it. I'm like, really, 22? That's a lot. And he's like, well, let's let's start counting. Do you have a security device? How many cameras do you have? Do you have uh, how many computers do you have? How many laptops do you have? Do your kids have iPads? Do they have? <laughs> I was like, okay, you win. Um, so it really is um, amazing how we've come to rely on it and that people do see it as a as a utility. Um, you know, I've said before, maybe to you, I I believe almost in my heart of hearts that my kids could survive without water longer than they could survive without access to their electronic devices. So the capacity is um, truly almost endless or limitless as long as, you know, it's just those electronics they've changed on the end. So that's a huge thing. Um, and, you know, the I, I've, you know, had rating agencies and others, well, what about when something comes along to replace this? And I said, you do know that we're talking about the speed of light, right? I mean, that the speed of light <laughs> that this the transmission occurs. So while other, um, uh, like Starlink, uh, you know, has its place, it's, um, you know, big dish up in the sky, uh, it's good to get to remote areas, but it doesn't have the speed because it still suffers when a lot of people are using it. And the beautiful thing about, um, you know, the fiber to the home is that it won't suffer um, from that. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention those things because I hear you talk and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is so exciting. They're going to be so happy when they when they um, uh, get this done. Then the other last thing is that you, you know, by having a, a system that the city uh, owns and treats as I believe it should be treated as infrastructure is that it is available to anyone. So if you have an incumbent that doesn't like it, well, they can come right on it. I mean, yes, as the question was asked, they can overbuild. They can build everywhere you're building. Or the rational thing to do, in my humble opinion, would be to connect to your system and also be a service provider and benefit from from that um, infrastructure you're putting in. So I believe everyone benefits um, um, when you do this, and so I'm I'm excited about it. So um, uh, now on to what you really wanted me to talk about. Um, uh, the fiber finance plan has changed over time. Um, I'm going to try. There we go. The, you can see I've switched screens, right? Previous finance plan. Yes? Yes. No, I'm talking to myself. Yes, it, it didn't move, yes. Laura. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was getting worried. <laughs> All right. Uh, the previous finance plan, when we first started talking about this a year ago, uh, you know, the task I had been given is we want to get this done, but we do not, under any circumstances, is what I was basically told, want to use the city's geo capacity. And you know, they said, can, can a financing still be done? Uh, Ten years ago, I would have said probably not. Today, or a year ago, and still today, I would say yes, with the right um, you know, skin in the game uh, or equity play by the city. So you would need to have some, um, you know, some form of skin in the game or equity. Uh, I talked, you know, frequently about that needing to be about 30% of the par amount of the bonds and <clears throat> that with that, uh, the balance of the system could be funded and secured by, that's the important word here, secured by the net revenues generated from the, the fiber system. So uh, um, under that uh, structure, the rates would be higher, obviously, because the bondholders are taking all the risk of whether or not this is going to, uh, or they're taking 70% of the risk of whether or not there are going to be enough users, that kind of thing. Um, as you had a transition in staff, uh, I was asked by uh, Kyle to provide a written summary of various ways that the city might uh, you know, provide that type of equity. 
And uh, shortly after that and further discussion, the staff modified its recommendation and said, you know, we think that the best the best play on this will be to do uh, general obligation bonds. So with that, there was a, a bit of a, a sea change in what we had been planning, uh, but it is uh, will is and will be uh, beneficial to to the project. <clears throat> so general obligation bonds, because they provide that backing of you know 100% of the the tax, and we'll, yes, you. Now, certainly now you're taking, I you know, all the risk, not just 30% of the risk, um, and you've, you know, taken the risk away from the bondholders. The benefit to uh, the project as a whole is now you've uh, reduced the interest rate. So the GL bonds will be investment grade rated. The uh, previous approach, they would have been non-rated, may be rateable after, uh, you know, the system's been up and, up and operational for five or so years but not from the the outset. So the general obligation bonds will, um, uh, you know, provide much lower interest cost. We don't have to fund a debt service reserve fund, so the par amount of the bonds is lower. And, um, you know, so it's all all great news in terms of the project. And I've got here in bold, it is still critical to understand that we haven't, like, abandoned the finance plan. We haven't said, oh, geo bonds, okay, Laura, you go home, <laughs> geo bonds, see you later. We still want to structure this financing so that it has the highest um, uh, probability of success that the uh, system revenues from the fiber system will make those payments. We've started to help that because, yay, we've just lowered the interest cost. I'll talk about that in terms of metrics here in a moment. But the finance plan is still to utilize those broadband revenues to repay the geo debt service. In our world, unlike most in um, you know, a commercial lending space, what you pledge, you're pledging, securing the bonds with your uh, general obligation uh, tax revenue capability. That's what you're pledging, but what you use to pay it can be something entirely different. The bondholders don't care. They care that that they get paid, and then they care if you don't pay. (laughs) They want to know what their security is. So you pay with fiber system revenues. They're happy as clams. Um, you don't pay, they will come after your geo taxes and that your geo tax levy, and that is that is the risk that you're assuming for the benefit of providing the the lower cost to to the um, the project finance. So a summary comparison, and uh, I I didn't uh, have time to call and, and discuss with uh, Doug to see if he thought you know my rates were in the realm of of um, where yours might be, but um, you know just so. Give me a little wiggle room, <laughs> but in general, if I look at a rated general obligation bond for Wilmer, and you have a great rating, I think you're double A three by Moody's, which is uh, is that right? Yeah, double A three, which is phenomenal um, and uh, something you should be very very proud of. We uh, structured the numbers that we ran just today based on um, there's a smaller city in Utah by the name of West Point, and um, they didn't issue geo bonds. They issued sales tax revenue bonds, but their um, rates are pretty much on top. Their rating was actually higher than their geo rating, and their interest rates are about where I assume that yours, uh, yours would be. So we used that for the rated scale. We adjusted for market conditions because they priced uh, quite a while ago. So we adjusted for market conditions. Uh, the non-rated scale is, give or take, um, you know, 80 to 100 basis points um, above, above or higher than the the scale that we use for the rated transaction. So you'll note here that this construction fund is the same for both of them. So you're probably saying, well, what? Why? Why is the par amount of the bonds, um, you know, so much higher for the non-rated bonds than it is for those rated geo bonds? Well, you have this lovely thing that's going to whack them almost a million dollars, eight hundred sixteen thousand dollars. If we do a non-rated system revenue bond, we will have to fund from bond proceeds a debt service reserve fund. <clears throat> so. That money doesn't get flushed down the toilet. It stays in an account that is, um, you know, monitored by the trustee. Uh, you earn interest on it, but nonetheless, we have to borrow it. And it just, you know, everything goes well. That money just sits around. 
until the final bond payment that's used to make the final bond payment. So that is driving up cost. Then you look at this next thing and we say, oh, look, you know, uh, capitalized interest is higher. For the time being, we are capitalizing interest and put a pin in that. I'll come talk to you about capitalized interest in a moment. Um, <clears throat> for the time being, we are assuming three years of capitalized interest. And, um, you know, because the interest rates are higher, we have to fund all of the, the interest that we need to pay the bondholders while your system's getting built. That's another 300 and some odd thousand dollars in, in increase. And the cost of issuance are higher because they're non-rated bonds. It costs more to get an underwriter to underwrite them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we, we do generate some original issue premium on the non-rated bonds, which, which helps actually helps us a little bit in these metrics. But the net, as you can see, we have to issue a lot more debt at a lot higher rates. So the rate of transaction, again, we're assuming 25 years right now, uh, three years of capitalized interest, 22 years of um, uh, debt service payments, an interest rate of 4.34 uh, is it our estimate on the rated GEO bonds, and the non-rated system revenue bonds would be about 5.25, roughly. So uh, as you all know, um, you know, interest cost is real money out the door. So visually, this is just a, you know, the difference of that debt service comparison. You can see down here the reason it shows um, zero payments is because we've capitalized the interest because this is when you're going to be building your system, getting people to connect. You will start storing up those revenues to make um, you know, the payments that come due here. And uh, the benefit of doing that rated GO bond is in this orange line, and the non-rated is that you know, significantly higher, um, higher number uh, on that black line. But we went with Halloween colors. So in terms of actual dollars, uh, um, here is the comparison. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've got no payments the first three years. We've capitalized interest. Then um, I've suggested we do an interest only, uh, possibly just to have a little bit longer runway to get all those revenues coming in. And then we amortize the debt over the balance. As, the, as we look at the difference in the, the GO rated versus the system revenue non-rated, we're talking about $150,000 of savings every year. Now, if you think of that in terms of, you know, okay, well, so so why, why I mean, certainly that's going to be easier, but sort of how much easier? Well, it is going to depend on, on what the net revenue is per customer, <clears throat> but for kicks and giggles, let's just say that, that um, you know, net revenue, so gross revenue less what it costs to operate the system, your net revenue line per customer, if that number were $30 a customer, and it could be 19 it could be 32 I, We don't know that number yet. But uh, if that number were $30, um, you know, that means you need 416 less customers to make this cash flow. Um, it means if you get the you know, level of customers that you think, you will have excess cash flow. Um, I firmly believe that the um, market for fiber um, revenue bonds is maturing. Uh, I have evidence to that. There's a small transaction. I'm not involved in it, but a small transaction in, um, in Vermont. Yeah, in Vermont. Um, it's not investment grade rated, but it is um, fiber system revenues only, and it is it has been rated by S&P. Um, it's a small, smaller deal, uh, but. You know, I've been all, you know, kicking up the pricks, so to speak, trying to get uh, Standard & Poor's to rate some of the um, Utopia bond and UIA bonds. They rated Utopia because they're all backed by sales tax. But the UIA bonds are system revenue dependent, and they will not give me the time of day. But Fitch rates them, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a sign there. So I really fully believe that by the time um, these bonds are callable, uh, could be in you know eight years, nine years, or ten years. By the time they're callable, I believe you'll be able to refund these bonds without the need for a uh, a geo backstop or a geo commitment, not this backstop. So um, you know, can I guarantee that? No. I mean, all kinds of things could happen in the market. I can't predict today. Rates could skyrocket. It may not make sense or whatever, but. You know, all things being equal, I think there's a very, very high probability that you'll be able to refund these geo bonds and not have them be geo bonds in, in the future. 
So the benefits and drawbacks of the general obligation finance plan, you know, I've certainly touched on the benefits. They're pretty clear. The interest rates are lower. You don't have to fund a reserve. So the debt service is lower, increases your likelihood that you'll be able to, um, you know, to pay for uh, these bond payments with those system revenues. The drawbacks, and you need to know them because you as a city council, um, you know, are going to be on the, you know, firing line, so to speak, your constituents are going to ask a lot of questions. And, um, you know, the first thing I will say to you that um, I tell all of my clients, it's okay (laughs) to say, I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you, so long as you really find out and get back to them. Um, Because you're not probably going to know all the questions they're going to ask you. Uh, but we can, you know, you've got a great team here, and I firmly believe that, you know, one way or another, we will do the research and find the answer to those questions. So the drawbacks, clearly the city is assuming a greater risk related to the system revenues and the repayment of debt service, where before, you know, on the, in the system revenue plan, you only got to put up 30%, you're at risk 30%. Here, you're at risk 100%. Um, you, you know, need to remember that while, you know, and again, we don't know because the, the first phase of the system is still being, um, I can't think of the right word, Kyle, but we're still figuring out what exactly the first phase looks like, how many, um, you know, businesses and residents are in to, you know, do the model. We're waiting for the surveys to come back. But I will, you know, tell you that we will get that detailed information for you. We will walk you through, um, uh, you know, my understanding is that uh, Hometown Fiber will put together a uh, revenue projections based on the survey results. I will critically review those, uh, as will Doug. We will use those, um, you know, as we structure the the debt. Um, But you are assuming the risk. I know the take rate won't be zero. Um, Let's say, for the sake of discussion, that it needs to be a take rate of 30% and you get 28. Well, if all of those are residents and not as many are businesses, I think you'll have a very healthy business response. But, um, you know, there may be some small portion that you have to, uh, you know, step up and pay with uh, some of your property taxes. So I can't look you in the eye and say, it is guaranteed that there will be no, um, you know, tax money ever used on this. I think it is highly probable that no tax money will be used on this. So as you were, um, as Marlena was presenting to you, I was, maybe because I'm ADD or something, but I'm like, oh, I wonder how Wilmer compares <laughs> to Tree Mountain. So Tree Mountain's a small um, city on the north northwest side of um of Utah, close to the very close to the Idaho border, where it's spit and hit Idaho, um, and there are more. A lot of the cities that I've worked in um, are are a lot in, in a more densely populated area than Wilmer. So I thought, well, I'm curious what you know what Tremont looks like um, demographically, and I know what their take rates are currently. And just to give you, you know, some quick touch points, um, the population's a lot smaller. <clears throat> they have a slightly um, younger population, roughly, you know, 2% um, uh, of, of their population is younger than your population. Uh, you have a slightly on the high end, so the, the census does it under 18 <clears throat> and then over 65, and the rest of it just kind of get lumped into nothingness in the middle. So uh, roughly, um, you know, two percent of the population is younger than yours. Roughly seven percent is older than your population. The median income is mm, within, you know, reasonable distance of of one another. Our cost of living is higher out here, but the um, uh, your uh, median income is about sixty thousand. Theirs is closer to sixty seven. Um, you have a slightly higher poverty rate. So I look at that and say, okay, so well, do I expect that Wilmer just, you know, finger in the wind? Do I expect that Wilmer's going to look, you know, sort of like Tree Mountain in terms of its take rate? Yes, probably not as high because of some of those things that I've mentioned. You don't have quite as young a population. You have a few more people in poverty. So I think, okay, you know, I, if, if someone were to convince me or, you know, to try to sell me that your take rate's going to be 60% when I know that Tree Mountain's 42, I'm probably not going to buy it. If someone says it's going to be 35, I'm going to say, yep, I think 
that'll stack up very nicely. Um, the other thing that Tremont has that you, you know, don't have that's a benefit to you is the people in Tremont do have access to other other options of of higher speeds um, from their internet. Uh, I think you have more businesses that will benefit <laughs> than Tremont just because of where they're located. So I, you know, I really view the the future as um, as being very very bright for you in in this project and what you want to do. Um, none of us want to be involved in a failed project, and I'm pretty cautious um, about what I work on because of that. And uh, I'm I'm very sold on you know all the benefits that this can have for you. So greater risk. Um, Doug's going to talk a little bit about the potential impact on your statutory debt limits. Uh, because it may impact other other projects that you want to fund. This is not my area of expertise. I'm not a geo bond expert in Minnesota. Come to Utah. I'm your gal, but I'm not in Minnesota. Um, and then this last one, which I think is very important for you as a council to understand, is it will likely raise more constituent concerns. So then we're going to go bouncing to this point worth considering. So uh, again, I've been you know, working in this space with uh, fiber for a long time, and uh, I have seen a huge, huge shift in um, uh, to the positive as to how it's viewed. I um, I worked with Utopia Fiber when, you know, I would say if you took a survey, <laughs> average people in Utah, they would say. Why on earth are you doing this, right? I mean, it would have been overwhelming that this is the stupidest thing, you know, any government has ever thought of. Um, the legislature was against us. Obviously, the incumbents were against us. Um, it was sort of like, you know, nonstop. And, um, you know, fortunately, my clients uh, were very dedicated to, uh, you know, they, they caught the vision, they caught the vision early, and they stuck with it. And now those same, you know, literally, same legislators who are now in legislative leadership, who are pretty anti-government money shouldn't be spent on this, blah blah blah. Um, they all use it and they love it and they they want it in in their cities. They're supportive of it in their cities. So I've seen um, you know a huge uh, shift because people know it's necessary. And uh, you know I I would argue that it's not going to get funded in an open access way where your end user consumers have a choice in any other way than if local government uh, if local government doesn't step to the table. So what the kind of things I think you're going to hear, or I may hear, I'm not ever going to use it. And that may be true. So I would remind them that not everyone in every community benefits from all public projects that are funded using geo bonds. I live in Murray. We have a great library. I drive past it a lot. I haven't stepped foot in it in probably 15 years. Um, we have a very, very nice rec facility in Murray, about a mile and a half from my home. But I'm a tennis player. I play tennis. And I haven't been in that rec facility since my kids were young enough to take swimming lessons. So, you know, some you use, some you don't. The um, nice thing here is I'm going to jump down a couple of bullet points here of this open access network's increased competition which is better for all consumers. <clears throat> um, you know, we all know, uh, you know, just the law of supply and demand in our capitalist economy, if you have one supplier and lots of demand, <coughs> prices are going to go up. If you have multiple suppliers, <laughs> same demand, your prices are going to go down. So we, um, you know, we have seen here in Utah, I, I think it's kind of stabilized now, but when um, uh, Utopia's fiber was initially being deployed, I mean, I had evidence of it. My father lived in a condo that did not have Utopia fiber, and uh, I live in Murray in my house that had Utopia fiber, and uh, we would both get mailers. They did it by zip code. We would both get mailers from the local incumbents, and they were offering me lower prices for the same service that they were offering him higher prices. So they didn't have to compete. So there is a benefit whether they use your system or not. There is the possibility, I would argue probability, 
that they will see, um, you know, reduced expenses out of their providers because they're going to try to, you know, keep those customers. Um, you've touched on it. Uh, the high-speed, uh, cost-effective broadband is really necessary to promote economic development. I can give you all kinds of beneficial stories in this regard for my clients that have done that. Um, some had to do it to keep, um, you know, some uh, some industries in their cities. Some had to do it to attract, uh, you know, businesses to their to their cities. Um, <clears throat> So the fact that it's an open access network, so early on, like way, way, way early on, there's a city in Utah by the name of Spanish Fork. They operate their own, it was originally a cable system, I think they converted to fiber, but they, the city, are the ISP, and they're the only ISP. So you can either choose Comcast CenturyLink or Spanish Fork Fiber. Um, <clears throat> so here, what you're offering, what Utopia offers, what, you know, uh, Lehigh offers, many cities that have done this, you're offering an open access network, meaning that, you know, like an airport, you, the city, will own the fiber, you'll own the infrastructure, but you're not going to, my airport analogy, you're not going to fly the planes. You're going to let Delta and American and whoever <laughs> fly the planes. So those ISP providers, if they're qualified, you don't want me to sign up being an ISP provider because I would completely screw that up. But, you know, if they go through a vetting process, if they're a qualified provider, there is no reason that they should not be able to ride on your lines. And so, you know, I think that's huge because um, you might hear, oh, it's not competitive. It's not the American way. The city shouldn't be in this business. And, uh, again, I would remind them who – who builds the roads? Well, cities do. Cities should. Who, who delivers on there? Is it just Amazon? Is it just UPS? <laughs> no, it's all of them. So your system is open, and I, again, I'm a huge proponent of that. And then lastly, you know, why, why would you put our taxes at risk? Well, the lower cost of debt aids the broadband finance plan by reducing those, those debt payments. And there may be other questions that you get. Um, I just know these have come up a lot in, in my, you know, career working on these type of transactions. And so I wanted to touch on those. Um, I am now happy to take questions from you. And, and if you have none, I will turn it over to Doug. Well, thank you. Um... I hear the caution in it. To the city as far as debt service and affecting other projects those are the things that I caught I, on the caution side I don't know about the rest of the council uh, we're assuming as she said greater risk and it has potential effect on borrowing Tom, you want to say something on that? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, it there would be some borrowing implications, and, and Mr. Green here, I think, is prepared to answer some of those questions because that could come into conversation with future city investments. Um, so that would have... Uh, I would appreciate your input, Doug. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I don't have any um, real prepared remarks or slides, but I'll, I'll just address a, a few of the things that I've heard. Uh, number one, just to verify, you, as you know, you, you do have the statutory authority to incur this debt, to issue these bonds, you know, for this project. And working with bond council, more likely, you know, they, they will also be tax exempt. Um, so again, that, that reduces the interest rate a little bit. Uh, the interest rates that uh, Laura provided, you know, I think 4.3, sure, that's in the ballpark. If you, if you see the for, for, I mean, she used a, a Utah um, comparable sale. If you look at Minnesota, yeah, I, I think it'd be less today, but you know, whether a, a financing's at 4.3 or, you know, 3.8, that's not gonna change it enough to whether you do the project or not. It, it's just gonna help or hurt. So, um, yeah, but 
those illustrations of the difference between general obligation, non-general obligation, it, it's like she pointed out, that, that, is, that is meaningful. Um, this statutory authority of uh, cities, municipalities in Minnesota, state statutes give municipalities the authority, the, authority, uh, the ability um, to <coughs> issue bonds for certain projects. This particular uh, authority is in the economic development statutes. It's called abatement. Um, cities used it twice in recent past for the pedestrian path in, two, in 21, and then uh, also for a portion of the Civic Center uh, project as well. Um, there is a limitation on how much d debt uh, cities can have, or I should say there's a limit on how much of this authority cities can use. Um, and so that would cut in, this project would obviously cut into that. And the reason why that's important is because you're considering a community center and this particular abatement authority is the one we would use to finance a community center. So if you consider uh, all three phases are built out and is, is 25 million a fair number? Um, that would limit any community center financing um, that would be financed. You use other sources, but uh, to about $16 million. So I, I'm not sure how prohibitive that is or not, but that's just the, the way the numbers work out. So, and then after that, if you were to do uh, it's small consideration, you know, for, for the future. If you were to do, you know, all 25 million for the broadband, say 16 million for a community center, then you wouldn't have, uh, it's a consideration, you wouldn't have that abatement tool anymore going forward. Whether that's a big deal or not is, you know, you might say, well, the, the benefits of having these two other projects, you know, well um, outweigh you know, not having that economic development tool in the future. So those are the uh, few things that I just want just to add to the conversation. Um, you know, I think it's good to bring all these uh, things up. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to, you know, what that, what that pro forma, what the revenue projections say, and how much debt service coverage, you know, the, the, um, this, this project will provide. I'll let the council speak, but I, 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 I get excited about it, and then I stand on the side of caution. It's council, Audrey. Um, just thinking about the different types of debt, and if, if we go down this road, what does it do to our ability for other types of debt? Yeah. When you look at our rating, or you look at um, what we're right. Gonna, yeah. Right. Good question. So it it, it doesn't prohibit you from it, it doesn't uh, it does not count against this statutory debt limit that some that we sometimes talk about. That there's a statutory debt limit that's different than the one that I mentioned. That quite frankly, your tax base is big enough; it's not even worth considering. It's you're not. Um, that's not going to come into play. That's like it's probably around seventy million right now, so it's not an issue. So when we do talk about a debt limit, there's a couple of them. There's that one that statutory debt limit that's so high that we're not even going to consider. There's this abatement specific one, and the two issues that I mentioned. It could potentially limit the community center financing and then the use of future abatement. So that that's two issues, and then third is just really a from a policy making standpoint, um, you know, how, how much debt are, are you willing to have? There's nothing, this won't uh, prohibit you from issuing other types of debt for streets or for, for any kind of other public uh, facilities. Uh, and will it count uh, another, just going down the list of considerations, it, it will be included in any uh, debt ratios that the credit rating agencies use, that Moody's uses. Um, I can show you that impact. I mean, you know, 25 million does sound like a lot. It, it, it is, but, um, you know, when you compare it to uh, the tax base, 
um, or when you can compare it to uh, the overall budget, um, it, it doesn't. Uh, I, you know, can't. You can never make any promises, but I wouldn't initially have immediate concerns that it would definitely, you know, have a, an immediate impact on your credit rating. But we can certainly look at what those what those ratios are. Okay. Kyle, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Doug, could you talk about the abatement? statutory limit when it comes to abate, geo abatement bonds and mm -hmm. and what that <clears throat> what that statutory limit comes from right and then how that could or could not change as the city continues to grow right well if you're like me you need visuals so I, I can provide it. it it's simply it's it's laid out in state statutes the state statutes say that uh, cities can only have uh, essentially on an annual basis, 10% of their tax capacity um, go towards abatement projects. So I um, just happen to have the numbers, you know, here, if your tax capacity is, you know, almost 19 million, 10% of that is, uh, you know, 1.9. So on an annual basis, the principal amount of all um, uh, all outstanding bond issues can't exceed, we'll, we'll use two million because that's an easy number. The principal amount of all uh, the outstanding abatement issues on an annual basis cannot exceed, let's say, two million dollars going forward. And again, we just, the only ones we have right now are around 50,000 a year for the pedestrian path. Did we did the Midwest, Midwest, but that's ten thousand a year. You know, so we're up to sixty, and so you know the, the limit is that's just a small portion of it. So that, that two million a year, but when we get up to um, you know the, the annual debt service on you know this twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven million is probably going to be it's anywhere near four percent. Twenty years is the maximum. It's going to be around two million dollars. So we got the potential of city hall, right? But remember, this is this is completely separate. So right now we're talking about uh, we're talking about this one specific authority granted in statutes that allows cities to issue bonds for these particular purposes. City hall is different, different. streets are different. You know, if you did a police station or public works facility, that's that's completely different. But you mentioned community center. But but community center is, if you think of a silo, if you think of a big umbrella, there's about half a do, half dozen, ten different silos. Each one is a, a separate. I use the term authority uh, um, that's outlined in statute. One of them says this is what you can do uh, for street projects. The other one says this is what you can do for uh, public facilities, um, and this one, this abatement one, which is under the uh, economic development statutes, are used for things like park and rec facilities or these, really everything else, the broadband projects, um, pedestrian paths, you know, th things like that. Um, and that's the one we're talking about that has a, a limitation. Yeah. I wrote down before that there would been would we would need to do a thirty percent equity. That that was when we were looking at doing a non general obligation. Okay, bond. So, so with it, this type, no down payment. No, no down payment. Think of think of this one is, I mean it's it's a G is it, like Laura mentioned it's a general obligation bond so. It, the property taxes are pledged as a backstop. We're planning on using, you know, revenues of the system. Just, you know, really like we do for water and sewer projects. We put a general obligation pledge on, you know, our water and sewer uh, bond issues, um, but we, we plan, we set the rates sufficient to, you know, pay debt service on, you know, for the water and sewer system and, and its debt service. So it's really the same thing. So, yeah, it's, you know, we, we could, 
we could actually, you know, combine it into an annual street project and sell it as one bond issue. And as Laura mentioned, bondholders don't care. They just want the general obligation pledge and the, and the AA3 credit rating. One of the things that Laura, right? Mm -hmm. Laura said was that high speed, cost effective broadband is necessary for industrial development. That's that, that's what, what really brings me into the positive side of this. You got something to say? No. I agree. Um, I just think that the high-speed fiber network system is is essential infrastructure for the city of Wilmer. It's the for the growth of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, not only in grow industrial, but at the same time, it would only grow grow the population of the city. I don't have a vote in this, but in any way, we aren't going to take a vote tonight, but what I just read of Laura's presentation, and then you talk about the greater risk for the city and uh, the potential impact on uh, borrowing for the city. Those make me nervous. Maybe they shouldn't, I don't know. Well, I think that Mr. Green also addressed that, that, that we only borrow in this type of obligation for to basically this kind of infrastructure and a community center. Anything else the city does, we borrow that in a different type of uh, general obligation bonding. <coughs> All right, thank you. Mr. Schultz. Who? Carl. Carl? Uh, just a lot of this is kind of over my head as far as what we're hearing, but to, to try to boil this down as simply as possible, the, the risk is if enough, we don't get enough people buying into mm -hmm. that, and then the city is on the hook for paying the difference. The reward is we draw in new business, new industry. Yep. The, just the general population is happier with their overall quality of life. So it seems to me low risk, high reward. I mean, risk is significant, I understand that, but but do we believe that it's really a high risk that there aren't going to be enough people, enough businesses signing on to this? I, I think in our industrial park, we've got businesses that will want to connect. And, and you know, you've got MB Rail moving in. Uh, we've got others that are potentially and some of them that are moving in. Um, I, th I think the, the, the amount of recruitment that Aaron's doing, this will, this is, this will be that. good. This will be, yeah. yeah. Audrey? Um, but just thinking about the financial obligation in what we would be borrowing. So if we're looking at a phased in project where on that sheet you gave us is five phases plus then extension, would we look to make sure that we can fund phase one to start the project? And then would we have to go back to make sure that we can fund phase two to start phase two? Or, I mean, what's our exposure if we're successful 
with one and want to stop? Or um, do you get the gist of my questions with looking at the phasing in and costs and payments and all of that kind of stuff? Councilmember Nelson, if I may. Um, you're spot on. You and I and probably the rest of the broadband committee had, uh, we're having the same thought. And when we look at this and we recognize other project that pro projects like the community center that the city wants to do, uh, we have to be considerate about what we're putting, what we're borrowing up front versus what we potentially would, would want to be spending on other projects. And so that's, that's one area that we were um, considering on how we want to fund, phase fund the project. And then secondly is, is risk mitigation. So let's say we were gung-ho, we do phase one for, we'll throw the ballpark number of $8 million out there for phase one to have that constructed online. Let's say uh, whatever event happens um, to the city and we cannot move forward with, um, the project isn't successful. Well, the risk is, yeah, the city is on the hook for that $8 million investment or that $8 million bond, but it's not the full $25 million. It, but so that's part of the risk mitigation in, a, in our eyes as well as we're doing this phased funding approach um, so we can really build out we can see the success we can see the sign up we can see the interest that's coming from businesses and residents so when we go back to issue the second and third phase of bonding we've got more data that uh, hopefully supports uh, moving forward with the phase two and phase three construction um, and again just kind of helps mitigate that risk as we move forward in different phases um, the intent is to continue each subsequent year with additional phases, whether that's combined phases two and three, or it's, um, I wouldn't say at this time the map in your packet is, is definitive. It's not 100%, on, but it's a, it's a snapshot of where we're at now where we think and where hometown thinks is the best layout for how we want to phase and com maybe do uh, cons combined construction cycles. Um, so really, we're looking at um, phased funding for the what-ifs, the, the unpredictables, um, how can we mitigate the risk the most to the city, and how can we be uh, responsible and think about other projects that the city wants to fund, i.e. community center, that would use the same type of <coughs> and, and like Doug, um, Doug Green had meant, Mr. Green had mentioned before, it's a, it's a limit, it's a tax authority that we're, we're limited. It's 10% roughly thereof, of the marketable, um, taxable market value of the city. So as the con city continues to grow, that borrowing limit also increases. Is that fair, Doug? Is that true? Uh, yeah, that's fair. So, I, I mean, if we can grow and have success with the city, I mean, the city has grown um, significantly just in the last two years for a very variety of reasons. Um, but if we can count on that continued growth of the city, I mean, we're hoping while we get to maybe phase three of funding that, that if we do build a new community center, when we have a new community center, um, maybe it's not 16 million anymore, maybe it's 18, maybe it's 20, maybe we're able to do more with our money uh, than what we're previously looking at in time. So it, this, I would say, is a living, it's a living project. It's moving, it's breathing, it's changing every day. Um, and it'll change every year that we move forward. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Well, one of the things that I asked him when we first started this, I said, how come the county gets all this money for all this fiber? I mean, they can, they're doing all this fiber out in the county. But guess what? The city doesn't get a dime. We don't qualify. And I asked, and that's one of the reasons we've asked others, are they going to be on board? We don't get a nickel. We don't qualify for anything being in the city. But you notice the county is getting all that nice fiber. We have to do something. I got a question, but I don't know if it, it's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, say that I want to hook up and I'm blocks away are we going to extend service out to my home in, in this example are you outside of city limits or what it, no 
in city limits. In city limits. I, I know that we're really targeting the industrial growth, but. Well, to that point, Mayor, we're, t we're targeting everyone. We're tar targeting every parcel okay. in city limits. Okay. Um, so what we're proposing or will be proposing is a build out fiber to the home for every business and resident in Wilmer. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Yes. Mayor, uh, from the looks on the city map, you'd be in phase two for your area. <laughs> I, haven't, I didn't <laughs> see that. Right, right there. So, yeah, it looks like you'd be, you know, one of the first <clears throat> ones, you know, right up after it gets done. You want to sign up now? Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else? If we're, if we're done with the financing portion of it, um, I do have a quick summary. Um, it's been a, a, a good conversation this evening, but um, there is one more piece of information that I would like to share with the council if we're ready to move on. Sure. What was um, also included with your packet, so it would have been the draft agreement, um, which is an, uh, the operations agreement between the city of Wilmer and Hometown Fiber. Um, and before I get into that, there are uh, two other um, organizations or two other individuals, um, organizations and individuals I'd like to um, credit this evening as well. One is our team uh, with Bolton and Mink, uh, Spencer and Dylan. Uh, well, as long with the rest of your team, have been working directly with Hometown Fiber from network design, putting it into construction documents. Uh, so a huge thank you goes to Bolton and Mink and their continued efforts um, within the city of Wilmer. And then secondly, I'd like to um, just make uh, Robert Scott, the city attorney, uh, he and his team have worked diligently and um, put a lot of time, a lot of effort into the document that you have in front of you right now. I will do my best to summarize the document that you have. Again, this is just a draft. Uh, what you're seeing, the latest version of what the city and what hometown are looking at for an operations agreement. Um, but this um, may change some before you uh, would be considered to act on it. So I'll preface with that. And Robert, uh, please feel free to jump in any time on the, if I misspeak or um, if you want to add anything. So. Included in your packet is the fiber communications operation contract between the city of Wilmer and hometown fiber. This operations contract details a proposed agreement between the city and hometown for the purpose of managing an advanced fiber optic communications network to serve the residents and businesses of the city of Wilmer. The contract outlines the terms condition, and conditions that both parties would agree and abide by during the course of the agreement. Generally, the contract specifies the rights, responsibilities of both the city and hometown and defines the scope of work to be provided, performed by hometown fiber, which includes the right to operate and manage the city network provided, provide connection services using the city network, general operation, and maintenance and fiber optic, inf uh, and the maintenance of the fiber optic uh, infrastructure as defined. As I mentioned, the contract specifies these obligations and responsibilities of both parties. Um, again, such as the insurance requirements, indemnification, and compliance with laws and regulations. Some of maybe some more of the specific things that you would be looking at, um, what the manager or hometown, which is referred to as the manager of the contract, in the contract, would be the connection services, the operations of the city network, consulting services, and collecting and providing end user information, maintenance and repair of city network, and, and it goes into more detail on what that looks like, what are the shared uh, duties between the city and hometown, but really it's, it's providing the day-to-day -day operation and coordination of repairs, preventative maintenance, field technician services, utility locating, uh, operation or agreements, which is, this is really crucial too, and it's identified in that contract or that agreement, is uh, contracts that hometown would be in the city would be working with to contract with other internet service providers to provide the service that we've been talking about tonight. So th those subsequent contracts would be created, um, like I just mentioned, to provide services on the city owned infrastructure. So in addition, the contract outlines potential, the pot payment terms, the conditions, including the fees to be paid by the city to hometown 
And overall, this operations contract establishes a partnership between the City of Wilmer and Hometown Fimer, formally. This is aimed at providing the infrastructure and management required to provide reliable and high-speed internet services to residents and businesses in the city, while ensuring both parties operate in a fair, transparent, and compliant manner. So as I mentioned, this is um, the latest draft agreement that you're seeing tonight. Um, it's 32 pages long. It is a, a good um, document to fall asleep to at night if you want to <laughs> take that home this evening. I know it's been a long evening. Um, but I really encourage the council to, to look at this document, dive into it, ask questions of staff um, so we can relay those to hometown, to the city attorney and his team to make sure that we're addressing every question or anything that you may have out of that agreement. Um, we will be looking to bring this back to you in February, um, at your meeting in February. Um, there might be a little more tweaking that you, you might see between what you have in front of you to what you would see on February 5th, uh, which I believe is the first meeting in, in February. Um, but please take a look at it. Um, I know it's been a long evening tonight, so I won't drag on unless there are questions about it. Um, otherwise, Robert, if you have anything you would like to add, um, please feel free. Very quickly, thank you, um, Kyle, that you did a great job. This is a services agreement. So the agreement uh, is clear that this is a city-owned network, or it will be once it's constructed. And then the city would be hiring hometown to provide services to the city in the form of operating and managing that network. Um, and I'm not going to repeat what Kyle said. If you were looking for exactly what would hometown be providing to the city what services is hometown being hired to provide. You can find that in section 4.2 of the agreement, uh, which goes on for a few pages, but it begins at uh, page uh, 10 of the draft that you have, I believe. Uh, and then, of course, the financial uh, terms and conditions still subject to uh, negotiation. I think these are not final yet, but those are contained in uh, Article 5 which starts on page 13, I believe. Um, so it's just kind of the, the roadmap. There's plenty of other language in there that's uh, all very important, but I think that the 4.2 and Article 5 would be the uh, <clears throat> provisions to focus on as you're uh, trying to fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that is our prepared agenda for this evening. Um, some of the deliverables I think you can look for from staff in the coming weeks would be, uh, I think you understand and I think got a good grasp on what the continued outreach and education proposal means to this <coughs> project. Um, so I, you can look forward to a recommendation from staff to the council on what uh, staff feels to make this uh, project, this that proposal successful, as well as you can uh, expect a um, a, another ver, uh, updated version or of this uh, operations agreement as well. So that's what we'll be looking forward to providing to the council in the very near future. Say, so, Kyle, is there any way you can pull this map, put it up on the screen so the ones in tennis here can kind of see where they live or what yeah. pages they would kind of be in? Um, or I don't know if hometown fiber has this we map. Will, we will put... All, everything that the council has seen tonight in your packets will be on the city website tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Um, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Well, thank you to the broadband committee members, David and Larry. Um, thank you, Kyle and Kyle. And uh, Marlena? Is that how I say it? Okay. And Doug. <coughs> thank you. And t thank you for your work on the committee. <coughs> All right. And, and Laura Lewis, if I. What's that? <coughs> Laura Lewis. Laura? Oh, yeah. Laura, thank you. All the way from Idaho. Utah. 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 Oh, Utah. 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 Or Utah. It's close. I'm close. It's, it's okay. close. It's west. <laughs> are you, where are you in Utah? At the moment, I'm in Murray City, Utah. My office is in Salt Lake City. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Certainly. 
All right. Thanks for letting me join by Zoom. All right, if that's it, I don't have a gavel. We're Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. We're adjourned.